Stephen Kotler is a four times New York Times bestselling author, an award winning journalist, and the co founder and director of research of the Flow Genome Project. He is one of the world's leading experts on high performance. His most recent work, Stealing Fire, was a national bestseller and nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. He documents an underground revolution in peak performance that is rapidly going mainstream, fueling a trillion dollar economy and forcing us to rethink how we lead more satisfying, productive, and meaningful lives. Steven and I talk about the science of flow, how one can get into flow, as well as what the future holds with technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, and biofeedback. Enjoy. All right, so Steven, the first question I usually ask my guests is, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? Oh, wow. Uh, writing researching, playing with dogs, and hurling myself down mountains at high speeds. Wow. That's, uh, that's quite the answer. Um, so, Stephen, so I became aware of you after hearing your, uh, your interview with uh, Jason Silva and Joe Rogan, and I read your book, Stealing Fire, and it really just established the, the internal framework of flow, and it really gave me you know, almost permission to start picking up these new different things and start getting rid of bad habits. And I think you've, uh, you've started something really big here, Stephen. So thank you very much. Thank you for saying so. That's very nice of you. Awesome. So Stephen, I would love it if, you know, we could start off here with, um, with your story. I know that you face some hardships and, you know, you, <laughs> you, you interacted with a surfing board. I love that story. I'd love it if you could share that with my audience. Sure. Um, so when I was about 30 years old, uh, I, uh, I was a journalist at the time, pretty successful. Um, and I got, uh, Lyme disease and, uh, was, was just sort of destroyed. And spent the better portion of about three years in bed. And for anybody listening who doesn't uh, know what Lyme disease is like. It's sort of like the worst flu you've ever had crossed with paranoid schizophrenia. So mm. physically I was, I was wrecked. I couldn't walk across a room. Um, the bigger problem was cognitive. Uh, the, the disease had started creeping into my brain and I was hallucinating. My short-term memory was gone. My long-term memory was gone. I could, could barely focus. I could barely function. And I was really sort of like lucid and able to work about an hour, a couple hours a day at best. And uh, I was going to end my life because I kind of figured at that point, the only thing I was going to be was a burden to my friends and my family. The doctors had pulled me off drugs. Nobody knew if I was ever going to get any better. And uh, sort of into this puddle of darkness, uh, a friend, I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and a friend of mine showed up at my house and demanded that we go surfing. And, you know, it was a laughable request. I, yes, I knew how to surf. It had been about four or five years since I'd actually done any surfing. But, uh, you know, I couldn't walk across a room. But my friend was absolutely insistent and wouldn't leave and wouldn't leave and wouldn't leave. And after, you know, hours and hours of her badgering me, I was like, you know what? What the fuck? Let's go surfing today. What is the worst that can happen? And uh, they put me in a car and drove me out to Sunset Beach in Los Angeles which is one of the mellowest beginner waves in the world. And they gave me a huge board and the bigger the board, the easier it is to surf. And, you know, they basically had to carry me, take me by each elbow basically and lead me out to the break. And it was a tiny, tiny day. There was, I don't think anybody else was out. Um, the waves were really small, one to three feet maybe. And uh, this little wave came and I'd been out there maybe 30 seconds um, and Muscle memory took over. I don't really know what happened. And I, and I spun my board around and I paddled a couple times and, uh, and popped up to my feet and, you know, popped up into a dimension that I didn't really know existed. I uh, felt like I could see out of the back of my head, like I had panoramic vision. I felt like I was having an out of body experience. I was floating above my body a little bit. Um, I was performing really well. I was surfing incredibly well. But the most amazing part about the entire thing is kind of, I felt great. The pain in my body that had been there and crippling for, for three years was just gone. And I was clear headed and thinking and the wave felt amazing. And, 
And that one wave felt so good. I caught four more that day. And on the fifth day, or on the fifth, after the fifth wave, I was just gone. I was disassembled. And they drove me home and they put me in bed and people had to sort of bring me food for the next uh, 14, 15 days, a couple of weeks um, until I could walk again. And I like, I mean, food because I couldn't make it across my kind of apartment to my kitchen to make a meal. I was literally kind of that exhausted. But on the 15th day, um, I, when I could walk again, I caught another ride back to the ocean and I did it again. And over the course of about six to eight months, when the only thing I was doing different in my life was surfing and having these really powerful altered state experiences, I got better. I went from 20% functional, 10% functional, about 80% functional. And, you know, I'm primarily a science guy and um, I don't have quasi mystical experiences. And I certainly don't have them while surfing. And even though I was feeling so much better, I uh, kind of assumed that the reason I was having these strange altered state, semi-mystical experiences out in the waves was because the brain had gotten into my disease or into my brain. And even though I was feeling better, it was killing me. And so I sort of lit out on a giant quest to figure out what the hell was going on. And, you know, I very quickly discovered that these states of consciousness have names. We call them flow states. And, you know, I very, very soon after that learned uh, that they have a kind of a profound impact on the immune system, and the nervous system, which could explain why I was feeling so much better. And it didn't take me long to sort of figure out that the same state of consciousness that was helping me go from seriously subpar back to normal was helping normal people sort of go all the way up to Superman, which, you know, not surprising, flow is defined as an optimal state of consciousness where we perform our best and we feel our best. But uh, people that I was studying at the time had figured out how to use it to really, really amplify performance. So that's sort of where all this started for me. Stephen, thanks a lot for for sharing that. Lyme disease is 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 really brutal. I'm I'm glad you came out of it. And you know, your your story to me of where, you know, you're kind of rehabilitating brings up, you know, one of the quotes that that you have and it's altered states become permanent traits. And I'm really glad, you know, you wrote this book that's you know, just packed with science because I've I've become aware of this term flow about only two years ago. I had sometimes obviously experienced it, didn't really know what mental box to put it in. But what I want to ask you is, you know, how has the the science on this changed? I feel like this isn't a hundred percent mainstream yet, but I, you're definitely helping push that message forward. Well, so flow science Really, I mean, it dates back to the late 1870s. Nietzsche, not often thought of as a scientist, um, he's thought of as a philosopher, though he he was hugely influenced by what was then the kind of brand new field of psychology. He wrote about flow. Uh, early research was done in flow in psychology and in what became cognitive neuroscience. William James, sort of the first uh, American, uh, the founder of, of psychology in America, taught at Harvard. Um, wrote about flow. There's a kind of a long history. It really came of age in the 60s and 70s when a guy named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who was at the University of Chicago, he was the head of the psychology department. He sort of did some foundational research on the state. It's from Csikszentmihalyi that we learned that, you know, flow. Let, and, but be, by the way, be, before we get too deep into this, let me give a quick definition of flow for your listeners, just in case they don't know. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, it's an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. More specifically, it's those moments of kind of total absorption, rapt attention. You get so focused on the task at hand, everything else disappears. Your sense of self disappears. Time passes strangely, really, really quickly, or sometimes it'll slow down. You get a freeze frame effect from an enemy who's been in a car crash. <sighs> Action and awareness will start to merge. So be totally immersed in what you're doing, as I said. And all aspects of performance, mental and physical, go through the roof. So Chick set me high in the in the sixties and seventies and on into the eighties and, and um, figured out a bunch of things that are really foundational. He figured out that flow is universal, it shows up in anyone, anywhere, provided certain initial conditions are met. He figured out that the happiest people on earth, the people who have the most meaningful and satisfying lives, are the people with most flow in their lives. Uh, some other foundational stuff to that. 
Um, after his work was done, the next question people turn their attention to is, oh, it's optimal performance. How optimal? What are we talking about? And so for about 20 years, people looked at that and figured out that it's peak performance. It's, you know, underpins major breakthroughs in science and technology is responsible for tremendous leaps in business, in the arts, uh, in, in, uh, athletics. We have some of the most compelling data and pretty much every world medal or, or, or gold medal is pretty, pretty much from one. Well, that, that was world championship and gold medal. I'm still trying to figure out how to speak today. Um, has a flow state at its heart. So, um, pretty revolutionary stuff. And then over the past 15 to 20 years, which is much more of the stuff that I cover in Steel and Fire, um, neuroscience has sort of uh, been accelerating uh, very, very quickly. Brain imaging is getting really good and or much better. Um, and we've been able to peer under the hood for the very first time and figure out kind of where is flow and, and where is it coming from. And we've made significant progress. We have a really good understanding of you know, the, the neural anatomical changes that happen in flow. So which parts of the brain are turning on and off. We have a decent understanding of the neural electricity of the state kind of brain waves and what it does there. We are starting to get a better handle on the neurochemistry and we are starting to get our first look at kind of networks, which is, you know, kind of the latest cutting edge of neuroscience is looking at kind of whole networks. So we've got a pretty good, picture of flow there is still a tremendous amount to be learned like holes in the research you can drive a bus through but uh my lab other people's labs are have been have been really kind of working hard on this i think there are four or five kind of major flow research programs around the world at this point hundreds of people who are now uh sort of getting phds are looking at it um it's become uh it's be, it's getting a lot of attention lately um and, uh, and I think it is, you know, I mean, I don't know how deep it's penetrated into the mainstream, but, you know, I know who we're partnered with on our bigger research projects. For example, we're doing a, a, a really deep look into and flow and business success. McKinsey, the consultancy had looked at this a bunch of years ago and they found some really tantalizing stuff. And we've teamed up with Deloitte consultancy to take a look at flow and business success. And, you know, I think if you're looking at things like, like business success, um, you're, you're more in the mainstream. We're also, you know, at the flow genome project, cause we're a research and training organization, you know, on the training side, we work with everybody from Google to the U S uh, armed forces through, uh, companies like Ameritrade. So it is, it does seem to be getting a lot more attention, um, in mainstream America than ever before. And, and by the way, why not? I mean, at this point, you know, yoga and other other things that kind of affect states of consciousness. Yoga has become a multi-billion dollar industry. I just saw a number um, recently that's closing in on $50 billion a year. 44% of American companies are rolling out mindfulness training programs this year. So I think, you know, this stuff is starting to push into the mainstream. I think that's what we're starting to see. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about this in the book and it's the altered states economy is 4 trillion. I don't know if it's gone up or down since since then, but this is it's definitely gone up. It's definitely gone up. Yeah, that so what we did is so to make that for that to make sense. Uh so one of the things that has come out of all this neurobiological research is uh this so earlier I mentioned William James. In the turn of the century William James wasn't just studying flow. He was studying sort of all altered states of consciousness. And he was particularly interested in what is now kind of talked about as the ecstatic spectrum. These are all the experiences that are sort of north of happy, psychedelic experiences, meditative states, trance states, mystical states, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, speaking in tongues, those kinds of things, um, contemplative states, yogic states, and so forth. And he said, you know, I think... These are all roughly the same thing. He said they're all psychologically real, meaning people are, are permanently changed on the other side of them, and they're phenomenologically similar, meaning they make people feel sort of the same way. The same experiences are, are, are sort of present in all of these things. He said, and this is interesting. And 100 years uh, went by, and nobody really paid much attention to that idea. But now when we sort of look at the neurobiology 
uh, we start to see that a lot of altered states, all these kind of north of happy experiences that James pointed at, they do share a lot of underlying neurobiology. So the state of awe is sort of similar to the state of flow, which is sort of similar to MDMA or marijuana, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, as a result, one of the things we decided to do is we decided to see how much money people spend around the globe seeking these experiences. Now, mind you, some of this is really conscious and some of it is just unconscious addictive behavior. So this is not all positive um, at all, but we just wanted to put a number on it. And that number is $4 trillion a year, which is one sixteenth of the global economy being spent pursuing states of consciousness very similar to flow or flow. And that's a massive number, and it's only growing. For entrepreneurs, this is a huge growth industry. And one of the reasons why is technology is starting to really come online, right? For a long time, you wanted to shift your consciousness. The only thing you sort of could reach for was a pharmacological substance. And that's right for some people and wrong for a lot of other people. And now we're starting to get technology that's helping us do the same thing. And that's really an exploding growth category. Absolutely. And for sure, it's definitely going to go up from here. And I, the ways are definitely going to get more and more interesting. So Stephen, based, based on your experience, based on the research, I'm sure it's different for everybody. But what, what are some of the, the fundamentals that, that you've learned to getting somebody into flow? So we've learned a handful of things um, that, are, that are really useful. And, and, and I'll go through like the two sides of it. One is that um, we know flow states have triggers. Uh, there are, uh, normally I say there are 20 triggers. Um, that number goes up every time. And I've been sort of uh, working my way through the papers of a, an Australian researcher named Christian Swan. And he may have uncovered a bunch of flow triggers that we haven't seen before, but we know of 20 of them. And these are, this is your flow hackers toolkit. If you want more flow in your life, you build your life around these triggers. You build these triggers into everything you do. And the first thing you need to know about these triggers is the most obvious, which is that flow follows focus. It only shows up when all of our attention is in the right here, right now. Uh, so that's what all these triggers do. They drive attention into the now. And we think what that means neurobiologically is they do one of three things. They either increase the amount of norepinephrine or dopamine in your system, both of which are, are two of the brains. They're pleasure chemicals, but they're also focusing chemicals. They really drive attention to the present. So if you can, you know, if these triggers put more of those chemicals into your system, it's going to drive attention in the present moment. Or we also see sometimes that these triggers lower cognitive load. So all the things you're trying to sort of think about at once and, and, and the stuff that you've got in your head, they lower that down. They give you more cognitive resources and they seem to kind of lower stress along the way. And again, and this has a, a huge impact on our ability to focus. So that's what these triggers do. And so the first one is, is the most obvious. Like when we work with organizations, I walk in the front door and the first thing I tell people is, if you can't hang a sign on your door that says, fuck off, I'm flowing, you're sunk. You can't do this work. And the reason is what the research shows is not only is, you know, uninterrupted concentration, absolutely critical, super important flow trigger for all the obvious reasons. But um, what the research has shown is that 90 to 120 minute periods of uninterrupted concentration are really best. That maximizes flow. Um, the only... Uh, only case where that might be different is if you're somebody uh, who gets into flow through social interaction, and then it may you may not you may be the only exception to this rule. But what this tells us, by the way, is that you know for for anybody who is, is working in a company that demands emails get returned in 15 minutes or a half an hour, or messages get returned in a half an hour, that kind of thing, this is a disaster for flow. It's a really bad policy. Um, and really needs to be changed for people who are working at home. You know, for example, in my own life, I obviously, you know, I make, I, I do most of my, uh, most of what I do is write books. So I start my day off. I get every, every day at four o'clock in the morning because it's dead, dead, dead silent. Nobody's calling me. There's no distractions. It's pitch black. I don't even have a light in the main room of my office because um, I like screen view. And I literally, the only thing I can see is the words on the page. 
My phone's off. My cell phone's off. Email's off. Instant everything is off. Social media is off. And I write for four hours. That's me. I, that's how long I, I, I like to take. Um, 90 minutes is, is what we recommend people, people start with. And really just fundamental. Just, just really a basic lesson, but really true. And by extension, by the way, anything that trains you up to focus more, for example, any kind of mindfulness meditation practice, yoga, anything along those lines that trains up focus is also going to help flow. So that's a really simple place that anybody can sort of start with this stuff. And then the triggers sort of go from there and get more complicated as you go along. For for sure. Um, what have you guys found in terms of exercise-induced flow? So one of the things that happens in the brain when we get into flow is what's called transient hypofrontality. It's a fancy way of saying that large swatches of your prefrontal cortex deactivate. This is why time passes so strangely in flow because time's actually a calculation performed all over your prefrontal cortex and as parts of it start to wink out as you move deeper into flow, you can't perform this calculation, you can't separate past from present, future kind of, kind of thing. This happens automatically with exercise. So you have what's known as exercise-induced transient hypofrontality. You've had this experience. 20 minutes into a workout or a hike or whatever, it gets quiet upstairs, right? A little more space in your head. That's, that's what that is. And um, so exercise is really strongly correlated with flow um, on, on that level. Also, um, it's a little more complicated. I won't go into it right now to say, sort of unless you want me to, but uh, tuning your stress levels is really fundamental to flow and getting really, really gritty is really fundamental to flow. And I don't, I don't think you can train grit without uh, training your body. I don't, I, I just don't think it's, or, or not very well um, as far as I can tell. And you know, the, the relationship between stress and exercise is so clear. It's so hard to sort of keep calm enough for consistent repeated flow without exercise um, that it's sort of, you know, it's sort of fundamental. Yeah. Very well said, Stephen. And what uh, I was curious about this, how do, you know, different, different chemicals like maybe coffee, caffeine, maybe for different people, does alcohol cannabis. Um, I know you talked a lot about psychedelics in your book, but can somebody almost put themselves or help facilitate or make that flow state deeper by drinking a cup of coffee? Um, I think coffee helps for sure. Um, some people uh, like nicotine as well. Um, whatever. I mean, like even non-smokers are using like nicotine gum occasionally. So these are all, these are because they help you focus, right? Those are, those are, those are focusing chemicals. The thing you need to know about the actual flow state is there is no pharmacological intervention uh, that works all the time. There just doesn't appear to be one. Um, marijuana. So there's, there's something called and this is I. So a lot of my work in my earlier one of my earlier books, Rise of Superman, even in an earlier book than that, West of Jesus. Um, these books are focused on action sport athletes and flow and action sport athletes have become some of the best flow hackers on earth, um, mostly because it's survival in action sports at any high level. When you're doing anything of consequence, um, it's, flow is sort of mandatory. You can perform really well without it, but it's really, really hard. And usually if you're not in flow and you're doing something super gnarly, you're going to the hospital. And so they've gotten very good at putting themselves in flow. And one of the things you see in action sports is people talk about what's called the hippie speedball, which is um, a cup of coffee and a bong hit and then going skiing or something like that. And um, the actual order matters. And it, the order seems to be about 20, 25 minutes of exercise to, till you get that transient hypofrontality we talked about earlier. It gets quiet upstairs and then coffee and marijuana. And one of the reasons is, no, and the marijuana has to be sativa. So it's got to have some dopamine on the front end of the marijuana high. Um, sativa and indica are different that way. And the combination mimics, we believe, the neurobiology of a flow state somewhat closely. Um, so that for, for people who, who, you know, 
live in Colorado or, or Washington or Nevada or a couple other places at this point um, and, you know, tolerate marijuana well, that uh, that tends to be a quick fix. Um, I don't think it's an everyday one, but uh, it definitely it definitely can work. But as a general rule, um, I, you know, I prefer the psychological interventions and I prefer them simply because. For me, this stuff is optimal performance, and I always want to be able to perform my best no matter you know what's around. So I don't want to have to have a substance with me. I don't want to have to have a technology with me. I like to understand how the psychology works because it works anywhere. Yeah, th- thanks for talking about that, Stephen. Um, you know, I, one thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, not necessarily you know, substance inducing, uh, flow chemicals, like trying to take bong hits until you get into flow. But do you find that in this field, people kind of fall into the slippery slope? Is there a, a danger in the constant pursuit of flow? Do people fall into different traps? Oh yeah. I, so, I mean, a whole chapter in rise of Superman and a whole chapter in stealing fire for that matter are devoted to the dark side of flow. So there are five neurochemicals that show up in flow. They're the five most potent addictive neurochemicals the brain can produce. Flow is one of the, one of, if not the most addictive state on earth. And Chick sent me high has said it's a positive addiction because it leads forward into the future because it requires you using your skills to your utmost to get into flow. And he's right about that. Um, but it's a neutral tool, right? So like, don't think for a second that like, you know, soldiers in a firefight or, you know, cat burglars stealing your jewelry aren't in flow along the way, right? So it's a neutral tool. It can be used for good or for evil. And it's very addictive. We like, we always like to point out that, um, this is big boy stuff. It's not, this is not like self-help. Self-help, if you can get a kind of persistent change over three months, that's a 5% improvement in your life, that's a big deal. Flow, and this is going by everybody's numbers, not just my research, but stuff done at Harvard, stuff done at the Department of Defense, on and on and on. Flow, you know, can amplify creativity to 300, 400%. It can pump up learning rates. Uh, the DOD did an experiment and they saw learning, I think it was 230% faster than normal. It might have been 270. I'm just forgetting right now the actual number. But these are huge spikes. But they they come with way, way more responsibility. Flow is a grabby state. And it, it can it can there's all kinds of perils. One is that, and you see this a lot in kind of the spiritual community, people become bliss junkies. They think flow is how life is supposed to be. And I'm not going to do anything if it's not that flowy and easy and moving. And that's just total crap. That's a disaster. And, you know, essentially another excuse for laziness. Um, And it really won't get you into flow at all. Mm -hmm. Trying to put, trying to live a flowy life will not get you into flow because you're trying to be mellow and relaxed and you're not paying enough attention. So like in action sports, for example, the easiest way on a mountain bike, I know of to go to the hospital is to get on a mountain bike and say, Oh, I'm going to have a flowy ride. Cause what ends up happening is you just, you're, you're fighting for like something that's mellow and it's a really violent sport and you have to attack it to get the amount of focus you need. And that may be, by the way, you know, we don't know this for sure, but uh, one of the early big kind of thinkers about the neurobiology of flow um, was a guy named Greg Burns still is a great researcher. He's at Emory. And he argued that there might be testosterone at the front end of a flow state. Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I don't know if he's right or we don't, nobody, nobody has looked yet. Um, but it, it strikes me as, as he could be right um, for that very reason. So um, I don't know how I got here. What question? Oh, the dangers of flow. So um, <laughs> bliss junkie is one. The another one that, that it is, I think, probably just as bad is people – get themselves into a really high flow environment. And um, and then that environment goes away for whatever reason. I'll give you a couple examples in a second. Um, and then they're sort of locked out of flow. And that's a really bad crash. So the, the two examples I like to give on this, one is, you know, we see it with professional action sport athletes who are retiring or former special forces, Navy SEALs, who we do some work with. They have a very hard time readjusting to normal life because they have very, very, very high flow jobs. 
Um, risk is another flow trigger. Doesn't have to be physical risk, but physical risk is great. So um, those are very high flow jobs. We also see it in the startup world. Startups themselves, for a variety of reasons, tend to be really high flow. And when the company starts to calcify, as it makes the transition out of startup into real company, and there's less novelty, complexity, and unpredictability are also flow triggers. And so is risk, as I said. So as companies start to solidify, there's less novelty, complexity, unpredictability, and risk, and flow gets dialed down. So one of the things you see is serial entrepreneurs. I work with Peter Diamandis, who's uh, the co-founder of Singularity University X Prize, and we've written a couple of books together. And Peter's, I think, onto his 22nd company. That's um, part of that is, you know, he's very entrepreneurial and wants to make a huge dent in the world. And that's awesome. And part of it is Peter will tell you he's he's addicted to the flow high that comes from starting something. Um, Yeah, that's, you you know, we're we're, we're playing with fire. (laughs) Um, Stephen. Well, it's you are and you aren't because let's talk. Let me let me. Give you, let me all argue the other side of this equation for one second, though. Because mm. you are playing with fire, but the point, and this is why we wrote Stealing Fire and called it Stealing Fire, is I don't think we get we have a choice. And I'll give you two reasons. One, at a bu- just simple business level. So I said earlier that McKinsey did some really tantalizing flow in business research. They found that top executives in flow repeat report being 500% more productive in flow. That's a massive uptick in productivity. And, you know, my organization, a lot of other organizations are training companies how to do this. So from a market economic standpoint, if company X is trained up in flow and everybody's 500% more productive a little bit of the time, even not even all the time, just a little bit of the time, um, you're going to get a huge difference. So McKinsey also figured that if they could get a fat 5% overall boost or 15% overall boost in flow in the workplace, overall workplace productivity across the boards would double. Um, just to give you an example, we did a six week joint learning exercise with Google not too long ago. Uh, we trained a bunch of Googlers up in the sort of some high performance basics and, 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 and four or five uh, basic flow triggers and how to use them. And after six weeks of, of work, we saw a 35 to 80% increase in flow. So this stuff is very trainable wow. and it's showing up in the business environment. So I think going forward into the future, if you're going to compete, this stuff is going to be mandatory. That's A. B is this. What the research consistently shows is that the most important skills for thriving in the 21st century are creativity, collaboration, cooperation, those sorts of things. And what the research also shows is we're really hard at training people in those skills. And the reason is we keep training people up in skills and what we need to be doing is training them up in states of consciousness. What the research shows is you want to be more creative, you want to be more cooperative, you want to be more collaborative. Flow is the technology evolution invented to make us good at those things. So you have to, if you if you really want to thrive in this in this coming hundred years, you're really going to have to get good at this stuff. Very well articulated. I love what you just said. We're trying to train skills when we should be training states of mind. That's that just to me that gets it. So Stephen, I'm 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 curious. So I'm in the virtual and augmented reality space, and you know I'm just curious. What's your take on 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 that kind of industry when it you know pertains to flow? Oh, you and I, you and I get to have the fun conversation right now. (laughs) So um. I said earlier that we see learning spike massively in flow, right? The reason is, quick shorthand for how learning and memory works in the brain is the more neural chemicals that show up during experience, better chance it'll move from long-term holding into, or short-term storage into long-term holding, right? Flow is this huge neural chemical dump. So you get huge spikes in, in learning, in memory, in flow. So why does this matter so much? Well, we know video games are addictive. And why are they addictive? They drive people into flow. So for the the people who are addicted to it, you know, who have that kind of personality, games are 96% addictive. Why? Because video games are derived, have been designed for almost 15 years around some fundamental flow triggers. They you Chick Set Me High was a huge influence. And games are built this way. They're built to drive you into flow. And one quick way to tell how successful a game is going to be, how much flow does it produce? Now, 
Video games are pretty good at getting at flow triggers. VR is excellent. So here's the killer app. This is the big dream. The big dream is an immersive virtual learning environment that is built around fundamental flow triggers with an AI la layer that allows it to be individual custom individually customized to each student. So you get self-directed learning, right, which produces much better results in a, you know, fully distributed, obviously it's virtual, so all you need to do is own the goggles, basically, and a, and a computer, um, totally distributed, you don't have to build any more physical schools, individually customized, right, to dominant, you know, learning types and strategies and, and interests and all that stuff, huge boost in learning, and it's a high flow environment, so you're massively amping up learning rates. That, to me, is the killer app. That's one, I, we are a ways away from that for a lot of technical reasons that have little to do with virtual reality and more to do with flow stuff that has to get worked out um, before we can start building that to re at a really deep, great level. But we're at the front end of a research project that's gonna you know, solve some of that. And I think you know, that system done really well is three to five years away if somebody wants to put that money into it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I've, um, you know, I've, I've tried out a bunch of different virtual reality simulations and for some of the good ones out there, I'll just be in there for like an hour and my brain just complete flow and I'll take off the headset after I'll be like, wait, what, what just happened? And it makes me think like, you know, wh what's this going to yeah. be? Yeah. So now, now let's talk about the dark side <laughs> of everything I just said. Okay, so the upside is the learning environment, the dark side, and you know this, right? I mean, people are already checking into the matrix via video games and dying, right? And not coming out, right? We've got people that there was that kid who died in, of starvation in Korea not too long ago from, you know, not able to jack himself out mm. of the matrix. And VR, because it's going to be a much flowier environment, right? It's going to be a much more addictive environment. And, you know, the upside is accelerated learning environments. The downside is more people are going to check themselves in the matrix and not come back. Yeah, for sure. And then you start, you know, combining other forces like, you know, pornography, you, you start to add in, you know, maybe like cannabis, some different things in there and you have a really, really powerful. Oh yeah, no, you, got, you got it right. Yeah, no, you got to, I mean, like where we are going with the combination of new psychedelics, new virtual reality technologies, new brain hacking stuff, right? Because your VR device is going to have EEG built into mm. it very quickly and things along those lines, right? So you're, we're going we're gonna to have the full complement of tools at our disposal and nothing, nothing in evolution shaped our brain to be prepared mm. to deal with that. Yeah, 100%. That was very well said. So Stephen, I know this is a, a pretty open-ended question and I know you're not a genie, but what do you think the world looks like is going to look like 10 years from now? Well, that's interesting. I just finished um, a near-term future thriller novel, my first novel in about 20 years, that is set in like 2023 to 2025, right in there. Um, I didn't think 10 years out. And the main reason I didn't think 10 years out, I didn't want to go quite that far is I think it's very hard. To, I, I, so I, it's very hard for me to predict blockchain and, uh, and cryptocurrencies and the, the massive impact they're going to have um, and VR. I think those things are very hard to predict um, in terms of how they're going to really shape the world. I, you know, one of the things it's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot smaller. Um, flying cars mm -hmm. are, you know, I, like I just, I'm writing a new book, Peter Diamandis, so we're, you know, talking about all the technology that's rolling out right now. I just, you know, finished a chapter on quantum computing, um, which is, you know, now available to all of us via like user friendly interfaces on the internet, which is insane. You can play with a quantum computer right now through the internet. Every cell phone on the market now comes complete with an AI chip built in. Um, they're neural net ready. So I don't know what it's going to look like. Um, I really, uh, in 10 years, I, re I really don't. 
Um, I, the only thing that I hope is that um, we spend the next 10 years paying a lot more attention to the environment. I love that answer, Stephen. Um, so to, to start wrapping things up here, Stephen, I'm a, I'm a pretty young guy. And, you know, for somebody such as yourself that's, you know, faced some adversity, came back and, you know, you're sharing the wisdom that you've learned in the places that you've been with the people you've been, and you're bringing it to the mainstream, the people, what advice would you give to, you know, young adults, college students that are living today in, in 2018? So I don't know. I mean, I like I'm famous for saying this, but like I always point out that there's only a handful of things we know for sure. You know for sure you get one shot at this life and you know for sure you're going to spend about a third of it asleep. So I sort of think whatever what you choose to do with the remaining two thirds is the only question that matters. And, you know, I fundamentally think there's you know, I've got one filter for people. Is the planet better with you on it or with you off of it? I came to build cathedrals. That's what I came to do. I think everybody should do the same. That's what I like. I, I you know, work your cockadoodle guts out. And by the way, that's the other bit of advice. Um, you have no idea how hard hard work really is. At I, Like I didn't when I was that age. I just had no idea. Um what that what the phrase hard work actually meant i heard somebody somebody told me recently that a good definition of hard work is hard work is the work that begun begins after you think all the hard work is done but that was pretty good um so i so i mean and that's the one thing that i like the thing that i wish somebody had explained to me when i was younger um and it's and, and i'm hesitant to say this uh because i um, I had an absolute amazing time in my 20s and 30s not listening to this advice exactly, but um, I, I, definitely, I definitely think that the real secret to life is that smart, hard work pays compound interest, and it's invisible. It's invisible for years and years and years and years and decades sometimes, but if you do something, anything, whatever it is, every day, get a little bit better, work at it, push at it, you know, make sure it's lined up that, that all your motivations are stacked around this. So it's, you know, it's your purpose. It's your passion. It's the thing you're doing. Do that for years on end. The compound interest on the back end is the, is the most rewarding thing. Stuart Brand recently said, and I think he's right. And I think he's also one of the smarter guys on the planet. He said, I think the only sustainable um reward is pride in one's work which i thought was really interesting and that's the kind of thing that comes it's compound interest it comes a little bit at a time over a really long time and that's really hard to see i think when you're young um and i certainly didn't it took me a really long time to see that beautiful answer i love the 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 intellectual humility um, Stephen, I, I have to ask you this question. So as a successful author to an aspiring author, what are the most important things that you've learned about, about packaging a, a book, an idea and sending it out into the world? Tell me a little bit more about the idea. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be difficult. I mean, like how cutting edge, how controversial, how like the, the, those things matter. I think. Um, but okay, let me give a general idea, a general example that I, that I love. Um, one, I always tell people, uh, and nobody ever wants to believe me, and then they get into it and they realize that I'm tr that I'm right that that, it, that it's true advice. The job of writing a book is only half done when the book is done. The marketing is the other half, and to me, it's the awful half. It's the, it's really hard. I do not like selling myself. It makes me very uncomfortable. I've never had a good time with it. Um, but I've also run some of the biggest and some of the more successful uh, book marketing campaigns ever. Um, so I, I, I've done it. I've had to, you know, bring other people in so I could watch how they did it and then try to do it in, in, in my own way. Um, but it takes as much work to properly introduce an idea to the world as it does to write a great book. Is, is the first thing. 
That that's awesome, Stephen. Um, you know, if it if it helps, like um, the the book that I'm trying to shoot for. This is a very long term project, by the way. Is kind of kind of taking a a tools of Titan Tim Ferriss approach to all of the the podcasts that I've had, all the guests that I've had on this podcast, and kind of distilling you know, what makes them tick, the kind of beliefs and stories that they have in their head. But um, I, I love that advice so much. Um, Steven, to, you know, kind of start wrapping up here, I just want to first off acknowledge you and say this show is called Humans 2.0. Without a doubt, Steven, you're a human 2.0. Your books, your talks, your videos are, I think, really opening a, a or have opened a new dialogue. And I, you know, from the bottom of my heart, I got to thank you. Um, and Stephen, at the end of each podcast, I'd like to request that my guest leaves the audience with a self inquisitive question, you know, just a, just a question that they can kind of ask themselves throughout the day. It doesn't have to be anything complex, but you know, if I've learned anything, it's that questions are really powerful cognitive tools. So I'd love it if you could ask my audience a question here. Can I give a little context around the question? Yes, please. Okay. So um, William James, who's one of my great heroes, who I mentioned earlier, um, was also one of the first psychologists really interested in high performance. And it was interesting. He came out of Nietzsche. And Nietzsche basically said, I'm interested in high performance, but I don't think, I think less than 10% of the people on the planet are going to be good at this. So I'm just writing for the elite. And his secret, by the way, was flow. That was, he ended up going in the same place that pretty much everybody else goes. He was just there first. William James came along and his idea was sort of Nietzsche for the masses. What could everybody else do, right? Like Nietzsche, Nietzsche thought that flow was only going to be for the creative elite, the creative geniuses who could use it to really see into the future and get us to a better, better place. And James said, hey, wait a minute. I think everybody's capable of that. And the first thing he talked about, if you read the foundation, the first psychology textbook written in uh, English, the opening chapter is about habits. And the reason is this was sort of back at the turn of the century, right before Freud, people were starting to pay attention to the unconscious. They were starting to realize that, holy crap, there's this huge part of me that's not rational, that's not logical. The whole like idea of the enlightenment that we can perfect ourselves with our rational mind just goes crashing down because we realize we're this mess of unconscious behaviors and that are most of what we do. This is absolutely true. And which is why James opens his book with habits. And his argument is essentially, if you are interested in high performance, if you are interested in anything, the place to start is with your habits. The place to start is with the unconscious shit you do all the time. Better habits lead to you know better people, right? So, so what is the the famous um the very famous quote? It was William James sort of paraphrasing Aristotle. Hold on one second, I'll dig it up for you. Because my question to people is, what are your habits? That's my question to people. Um, and the reason for this, if I can find this in my quote file, is. This, so this is William James paraphrasing Aristotle. So an action and you reap a habit. So a habit and you reap a character. So a character and you reap a destiny. And I think that's very true. And I think the question to ask yourself is what are your habits? What are you doing automatically, unconsciously? And how do you change those to make them work for you? Get your biology to work for you instead of against you. So that's my question. 100%. That was, that was so amazing. Right on. So Stephen, um, all, all the links will be down below to your website, all your social media networks. Is there anything that, uh, are there any networks you prefer? Is there anything that you want people to, to check out? Yeah. The, the thing that I, you, you really want to check out is if you go to stephencotler.com, um, you can download the habit of ferocity for free. You sign up for my email newsletter. I don't bombard you. I, it's two emails a month. One is a high performance tip and uh, one is sort of a roundup of really cool shit. And you get a free 90 page peak performance primer called the habit of ferocity. That is everything I talked about, about flow and a whole lot more um, that that's there for the taking. That's fantastic. 
Stephen, thank you so much for coming on. This was a real pleasure. This this is like one of those podcast episodes where I'm going to listen to like 30 times and get something different out each time. Thank you and everyone out there for listening. This has been your host, Mark Metric. Damn, you made it till the end of the podcast. That's really rare in the age of digital distraction. This really means the world to me. I really hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to hop on over to my website, Mark Metry, or message me on social media. I'm on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. My name is Mark Metry, M-A-R-K-M-E-T-R-Y. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what you learned in this episode and I'll be sure to get in touch with you. And if you really, really love the podcast, I'd highly appreciate it if you went on iTunes right now and left me a review. It helps way more than you know. Let's get this Humans 2.0 grassroots movement going. Woo! Get out there and do something impactful today.